the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. We all know that Elizabeth I died in 1603 and that James VI of Scotland succeeded her as James I of England. On this show, we've really only scratched the surface on this period in history. And today, what I really want to know more about is James's daughter, Elizabeth Stuart. You might know her as the Winter Queen, or the Queen of Bohemia, or maybe even the Queen of Hearts. Today, I am joined by Professor Dr. Nadine Ackerman, literary historian, author, and educator. Nadine's access to Elizabeth Stewart's original letters makes her the foremost authority on Elizabeth Stewart and the perfect guest for today's show. Nadine, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about Elizabeth Stewart today because she's a figure from history that we haven't really covered on the show yet. And I'll just start with a a quick little bio um, to get everybody up to date. She was the eldest daughter of James VI of Scotland and Anne of Denmark. And after the death of her namesake and godmother, Queen Elizabeth I in 1603, Elizabeth traveled south into England with her mother and her brother, Henry. Now, I'm curious, I want to start out with this trip from Scotland to England. What would their experience have been like? Yes, that is an extraordinary moment when her her father, James VI, has secured the succession of England. So he becomes James I of England as well. And they travel from uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, to uh, London. And I think, I'm I'm actually pretty sure, but I'm I'm the first in in the biography to argue that she might have met her brother Henry for the very first time during that journey. And they had an extraordinary relationship, but they might not have met before simply because royal children were raised separately. This might be the first moment that brother and sister meet. That's quite extraordinary because she and Henry ended up having quite a close relationship, didn't they? Oh, yes, absolutely. And therefore, I think nobody has even sort of considered uh, when they met because it's, it seems so normal to be raised with your brothers and sisters. Uh, but that wasn't royal custom. And they had a kind of joint court in England, which was quite um it was not not it was really the exception until her dad also sort of realized actually it's it's not wise to raise all my children and keep them in one basket. What if something happens? I need to actually keep them in separate courts so if if there is a plot and they manage to get to one child, they won't be able to get to another child um so there's also a safety measure to raise them separately later. But because of their separation, they corresponded. And that's also one of the reasons we, of course, know that they had such a close relationship. Because otherwise, if you meet face to face, there's no reason to actually record it. Then it it will all be hearsay. But because they were separated, they exchanged these lovely, uh, loving letters. uh, And we see them talking about education. She, She was taught Italian, but had really wanted to learn Latin as well. And she sort of uh, wrote to him saying, what, what if I taught you Italian, um, which you sort of failed in, uh, will you teach me Latin? And so they had a kind of agreement about um, exchange of knowledge as well, even at that early age. Now that you brought up the Latin thing, is it true that her father thought that Latin had the unfortunate effect of making women more cunning? Uh, I don't think so. There is this kind of story and that's kind of hearsay and that's all, always what is repeated. And hearsay often is the most, uh, it's the best story. But there's actually no real evidence that he would ever deny his children Latin or his daughter. That's wonderful. It made me think of Thomas Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk, and how he had said of his daughter, Mary Howard, at one point that she was too wise for a woman. So I almost hoped that there was some connection between Mary Howard and Elizabeth there. But if it's hearsay, then we we must set that aside for the moment. Yes, um, it it derives from the table talk of King James collected by Sir Thomas Overbury, actually an 18th century collection, 
And there it is recorded that James was reported of having stated that Latin was only there to make women more learned and foxes tame, and that it had the same effect to make them both more cunning. So it's this kind of neat little anecdote, which is repeated again and again, but there is no evidence that she was never taught Latin. One of the things that happened shortly after their arrival in England was the gunpowder plot. And we discussed that in a recent episode on the show. But I've always wondered, what knowledge did Elizabeth have that she was being used as a figurehead for the Catholics? Well, of course, this this is a kind of, um, she was born in 1596. So she is nine. She's a really kind of young girl, uh, but very much aware of her position. And she must have uh, heard about the stories that they had wanted to abduct her and raise her as some kind of Catholic puppet queen. And she has sort of reflected upon this and said, I, I of course, would never have agreed to, to rule in such a manner. I think it's important to realize that she wasn't necessarily referring to Catholicism at the time because she was raised at, until the age of seven in a household that was at least partly Catholic. Uh, her female guardian was a, was a Catholic. And of course, her, her mother, Anna, uh, later converted to Catholicism. So she would never have resisted or, or, or uh, reacted against Catholicism per se. Uh, but of course, she would have objected to her, her dad and her brother being killed. <laughs> um, so she is referring to, I, I would never have unjustly ruled in that manner. But it, it's it's that moment in history where you sort of wonder, what if the gunpowder plotters had succeeded? Yeah, exactly. Do we have any idea of maybe what Elizabeth knew of her grandmother, Mary, Queen of Scots? Yes, I, I wish she would have sort of reflected upon her grandmother. It, it's and there are hardly any mentions, even in, in later letters, I like to think that she was very much aware of Mary, but we we don't have uh, evidence. What what is interesting is that both women were quite capable of writing in cipher codes. And I I always like to think that it is Elizabeth who became so cunning because she knew of the history of of her grandmother. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. (laughs) So she was, as you had mentioned, a well-educated princess of England and Scotland. So when it came to the marriage market, who were some of the men that she was connected to at the time? Yeah, there were suitors uh, from all over Europe, even um, the king of Spain at one point. So there was a lot of interest in in this eldest daughter of uh, James VI and I. And it's important to sort of realize that the eventual candidate, uh, the elected Palatine. He was still in his minority, so he was actually the elected Palatine in waiting. Was, he was about to become the elector. Uh, was one of the um, most powerful Protestant princes in Europe uh, and, and not some kind of German count that historiography has made him into. So he was actually quite powerful, had a lot of influence. Therefore, it it was um, the candidate that uh, James felt most comfortable with. And is it true that her brother, Henry, also approved of the match? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, He, of course, shared the kind of similar uh, militant Protestantism um, that she also embraced. So he very much uh, approved of, of a Protestant candidate. He was uh, destined, uh, of course, that never happened because he died so young. He was supposed to marry a a Catholic uh, princess himself so uh, that there would be a a balance in in Europe. But he very much approved of of the the candidate chosen for her. Well, and you mentioned that Henry died young, so he died prematurely. They were close siblings. What can you tell us about her reaction to his death? Oh, she, she was devastated um she she loved him so dearly and it was such an 
unexpected death uh, in, in 1612, when her suitor, Frederick V, uh, the elector Palatine in waiting, had just arrived in England because theirs were, was not going to be a proxy marriage. It was going to be celebrated in a, in a, in a big manner. And Henry was very much of the, uh, part of those festivities surrounding the marriage, leading up to the marriage. And then he, he falls ill and, and he dies. And she visits him when he's ill and also tries to visit him when he's actually dying. She tries to uh, disguise herself to get access to his chamber, uh, but they fear that it might be infectious, so she's denied entrance. And she's heartbroken. Um, And it, it must have been incredibly difficult to immediately continue with the wedding her father actually didn't postpone the wedding, as a lot of people think. He brought it forward because there was a lot of kind of criticism. What if the heir of the crown can die so unexpectedly? What will happen next? You have her brother, Charles, who's, who later becomes Charles I, but he's quite sickly. So if if the strong and sturdy Henry can die, then Charles can can probably also die, uh, people think. And then we only have Elizabeth left. So should we really allow her to marry this foreign prince and let her, let her go to Germany? So there's a lot of kind of criticism at that moment. And James is afraid that uh, the people might put a stop to the wedding. So that's why he brings it forward. So the wedding is, is a weird mixture of mourning and celebration. And that must have been incredibly difficult for her. I'm sure they were trying to move forward as a country as well, much like present day, I would, I would think, with Queen Elizabeth II, with her passing and Charles coming forward. Let's move from mourning to celebration instead. Oh, yes. And that that's, of course, uh, uh, always the case. But when I think it's, it's of course, very different if, if a queen in her 90s dies or, or um, when, when a young kind of prince dies and, and not even having reached adulthood. So and, and they have put so much hope uh, in, in Henry. Mm. Um, so so it, it must have been really difficult at, at, as a nation to to look forward and, and to see see what's next. Mm, that's a good point. So a husband was chosen for Elizabeth. Is it true that Anne of Denmark was against this choice, that she didn't want her daughter to be anything other than a queen? I doubt that very much. That is, again, um, sort of uh, tied to this kind of um, idea that that women, uh, especially uh, uh, women who are a bit politically savvy, are are so ambitious. Um, I, I think she very much understood that Frederick V, the elected Palatine, was of the mo- one of the most powerful princes uh, in Europe. Yes, he was a Protestant, and yes, she might have preferred uh, the King of Spain, but she she at that point was still also still thinking that her son would have have a great match. When when Henry then later dies, it, it changes a bit, and she it isn't part of all the celebrations. But in the end, she's still very much approved and. Uh, looking at Anna's ancestry, she also had connections to the Habsburgs family. So she she wouldn't sort of disapprove of a Protestant match. It's just that she might have preferred the King of Spain. After Elizabeth and Frederick got married, where did they go? Well, they first um, went th- um, um, to the Dutch Republic to uh, strike an alliance with the Dutch and show themselves as this Protestant power couple. So they had a kind of progress through the Dutch Republic. Frederick went uh, ahead uh, to Heidelberg to uh, prepare her arrival there. She stayed on uh, enjoying celebrations a bit longer, and and then they moved to Heidelberg, the the capital of the the Lower Platinate. What can you tell the listeners about what the process looked like for Frederick to become King of Bohemia? Yes, that that of course happens um, um, much later. So that, or much later, five years uh, later, five to six years later. So they marry in sixteen thirteen, and he accepts the crown of Bohemia in sixteen nineteen. So they have this kind of uh, very difficult marriage in the beginning. We must remember that both of these, uh, Elizabeth and Frederick, were just 16-year-olds. 
and that this was a, a, a politically arranged marriage for for political and, and, and dynastic reasons. Elizabeth didn't speak German. Frederick didn't speak English. So they spoke to each other in French. In Heidelberg, there was an interfering mother-in-law who was also still there in the beginning. This was a kind of difficult marriage. The first child is born quite quickly, but then it takes a couple of years. And Elizabeth uh, very much has her own court in Germany, which is separate from from her husband's court. Uh, But by the time that uh, Frederick is offered the crown of Bohemia to go to Prague. They they have become much closer, and she, although she didn't advise him to take on the crown, she very much supports him in it as as a kind of dutiful wife. You mentioned their children, and I I do want to touch briefly on this because they had quite a tragedy happen not long after. Could you give us maybe, uh, they had a lot of children, but maybe give us a brief rundown of who their children were and and why we might recognize some of the names. Yes, they had 13 children, um, so quite a lot. And if you actually think about it, only apart from those kind of first years of marriage. So uh, one is born quite quickly, uh, but then it takes a couple of years, as I said. But then thereafter, she's pregnant almost their entire marriage. Um, so that is also quite an extraordinary thing to realize. Um, and the listeners might know of, of Rupert of the Rhine or, or Morris, uh, who fought in the kind of English civil wars as royalist commanders. Uh, another son, Charles Louis, who, who took um, the other other side and, and supported uh, Parliament. Uh, you, there's also uh, the daughters, um, a daughter also called Elizabeth, who became a talented philosopher and mathematician and who corresponded with René Descartes. You have Louisa Hollandina, who was a female artist and became the pupil of the painter Gerard van Honthorst. Uh, so all their children really deserve a biography of their own. Uh, so there's still a lot to be done there. <laughs> well, and, and one of the things that struck me while I was just doing a little bit of research before our conversation is that their eldest son died tragically. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Yeah, she loved him dearly. Um, he was called Frederick Henry. Um, of of course, also named after her brother, who died around a, se- a similar age. He it's it's a moment it, that that is so difficult for Elizabeth because uh, most of her children uh, reach adulthood, so she is not even used to uh, losing children. Like for instance, her mother had been forced to get used to. Uh, she never had a miscarriage, she she never had a, a stillborn. So she had never really lost a, a child in this manner. And then she loses her firstborn. Um, he uh, arrives at her court. She has just given birth to an, another daughter uh, and he craves his mother's attention, uh, pretending he's ill and he, he's uh, allowed in, in the kind of um, lying in chamber where no men are usually allowed to, to get close to his mother and they have a little conversation. And then someone comes in uh, saying that uh, the Dutch bring in this kind of Spanish treasure fleet and he wants to see um, the fleet and he persuades his father to travel to this fleet in a, in a little barge. This wasn't uh, planned at all. This just was kind of spur of the moment. They indulge their son and and go on this little kind of pleasure trip where to sort of see the uh, the treasure that is being brought in by the Dutch. And a, another barge hits their barge and uh, it it capsizes and um, uh, Frederick Henry, the eldest son, drowns. And his father has searched for hours and hours in in the kind of freezing water. And they find him um, the next morning and then he's frozen to to the mast of the ship and uh, being brought back to The Hague, uh, where his mother is presented uh, with his corpse. Uh, so she is absolutely devastated. What an awful story. When I think of stories like that, I want to transport back in time and just be a regular person who maybe witnessed these events or 
heard the conversations that were happening around the events. And I just wonder how different it was to live during a time like that. Yeah, it's of course something we we might never sort of, we can sort of come close to it, but we will never know. And of course, this early modern period is is a period in in which they don't really uh, reflect upon their feelings as much as we would nowadays do. So what what happened? I'm confronted with as a biographer is uh, at that moment complete silence from Elizabeth's part. Um, this is a woman who who writes several letters a day, and then for months there is not one letter in her hands. She has completely withdrawn in her own world, and I think that shows her, her the extent of her grief. But as a biographer, I, I, I didn't want to speculate too much, so I wouldn't sort of project modern feelings as she might have felt x y or said because we don't know we just have this this silence in 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 the records oh it's just so just so sad you know you can imagine we can imagine we can speculate how she felt (laughs) well let's talk a bit about the name that most people know her as which would be the winter queen why was she referred to as the winter queen Yes, well, I, I think she really wasn't. <laughs> so I, I think this is more a uh, what she has become known as because uh, that's what um, historians have referred her to. Her husband was uh, called the Winter King in one poem uh, in Catholic propaganda, uh, dismissing him. So it, it's it's a, a mock name, even though it, it sounds quite romantic now. But it was definitely to make fun of him. And that is sort of projected then by historians uh, upon her as well. So that's how she becomes known as the Winter Queen, because she and her husband uh, ruled uh, over Bohemia from one winter to the next. It's also often said they only ruled for one winter, but they ruled for for an entire year from one winter to the next winter. Uh, I've deliberately not uh, used it in the title of the biography. I've used the title Queen of Hearts because that is actually what her supporters called her. And actually, I've never been able to find another reference um, um, that her enemies would call her the Winter King, uh, Winter Queen. (laughs) Sorry. That's interesting. So I was going to ask you about the Queen of Hearts, because in my mind, I think we always know Elizabeth of York as the Queen of Hearts, but I love that it can be used for Elizabeth Stewart as well. Yes, we have these very kind of strong women in history uh, who are known as the Queen of Hearts. And, and uh, I think it's it's wonderful that um, each uh, generation uh, seems to have their own Queen of Hearts. I love it. I love it. So what caused Elizabeth and Frederick to go into exile. So they ruled for a year. What happened? They ruled for a year. They were, were elected as, as um, king and queen. It were the kind of Protestant uh, rebels who prevented um, the, the Holy Roman Emperor from take, also taking up um, the crown of Bohemia, which was usually the case that the emperor would also be the king of Bohemia. Um, the Protestant rebels put a stop to that. But of course, this emperor very much wanted uh, his his crown back, or that is how, how how he would sort of see events. So you have Catholic armies uh, supporting the emperor, and and they they were the stronger party. So uh, they drove them uh, away, and and they had to flee from the capital, even though um, Elizabeth refused for a very long time. She refused to uh, abandon her subjects. So uh, ambassadors had to come into Prague to persuade her to leave. Oh, so during this time, let's put it into context with the timeline a little bit. At the time when they went into exile, what was happening in England? In England, we we had a uh, parliament had had sort of opened. So James very much considered whether he should allow his daughter to return to England or not. And it was decided in the end that it was better that she would not return to England at at that time. Um, And they chose for The Hague, where uh, Frederick had uh, relatives. The the princes of Nassau-Orange were his cousins. 
and Elizabeth could serve as a figurehead for the English and Scottish soldiers who were stationed in The Hague because they also fought in the Dutch army. And because they could sort of see her uh, in The Hague, they could sort of see the princess for whom they would fight another war. So she had more power by not being in England, essentially. Oh, yes, very much from the beginning. And she later also realized that um, when she was widowed in 1632, uh, her brother invited her back to England uh, and and sort of very much encouraging her to, to return home, even sending an embassy of 150 men to get her. Uh, but she sent them packing. She just thought, I, if I stay in The Hague, I can really be my own uh, woman. I can be my own politician. Nobody will control what I, I, I will uh, do. Uh, so she was very much aware that uh, the distance from the court in England uh, was an advantage for her. I'm also curious, and of course, I'm going to jump forward in time a little bit here. I'm curious about where Elizabeth was when her brother Charles became king of England, and where was she when he was executed? Yes, uh, both still in, in The Hague. So Elizabeth uh, and Frederick turn up in The Hague in, in 1621 in April. And the States General of the Dutch Republic, they rent a house for them for, and they, they rent for furniture for, for three days, hoping that they will leave. But uh, she ends up staying for about 40 years. Uh, so she never leaves the Dutch Republic. So she is in the Dutch Republic when these things happen. And so she reads about them. And she is very hopeful when um, Charles becomes king. Uh, she thinks he, he will fight this war with the Spanish, uh, which her, her father never uh, dared to declare just before his death uh, that was about to happen. But it hadn't happened yet. Um, so when Charles then declares war uh, on the Spanish, she's very much uh, in favor of, of her brother, very much supports him in, in that decision because she finally gets the, the military support she, she had always wanted. But her relationship with her brother changes throughout the decades. Uh, she she then uh, is really angry with him when he, he uh, makes his peace with, with the Spanish. And then he, he almost becomes a kind of enemy. When he's executed in 1649, she, of course, loses her brother and is, again, devastated by, by these events uh, and, and by uh, these anti-royalist feelings, sentiments. She really lost a lot of men in her life whom she felt close to. And one that I feel like I just skipped over to get to Charles was her husband, Frederick. Can we touch base a little bit about when he died, maybe how he died and what her reaction was. Yes, he, he dies in 1632 um, when he has just joined the Swedish army and they're uh, about to regain those lost lands in Germany. When one of the consequences of, of accepting the crown of Bohemia is that the emperor stripped them, uh, Frederick, of his hereditary lands in, in Germany. And while they uh, quickly give up on Bohemia, they never give up on regaining those lands, the Palatinate. Um, in 1632, they think they will manage to uh, defeat the enemy and regain their lands. At that moment, however, um, Frederick falls ill and he, he dies in, in a Swedish camp. When she hears the news, and, and they try to keep this from her for about 10 days or so, but when she finally hears the news, she starts crying and then uh, again falls silent, never speaks for, for weeks. And, and she turns her entire court in, into a place of mourning. Uh, she decorates it uh, inside and outside her estate in The Hague in black velvet, and, and that is never removed. So that is also something people will have noticed when they would have visited The Hague. And she also, every letter she sends thereafter is dressed up as a mourning card. So she will use um, black seal wax and she etches the um, her letters uh, in black as well um, to, to remind uh, her correspondence that she she 
she was married to Frederick and that she is still mourning uh, his loss. You had mentioned at the beginning that you had worked a lot with her correspondences. And I'm going to put you on the spot right now and ask you if there was one correspondence from Elizabeth that maybe struck you the most or affected you when you read it. Yes, there are so many letters, um, which is, uh, and, and of course, I was uh, amazed by the amount of letters I I, uh, I stumbled upon uh, that nobody had ever looked at. When you sort of are sitting in an ar- archive, you sometimes still see the sand that was used to uh, dry the ink, which meant that nobody had really looked at these letters, at these letters apart from uh, from me and the and the recipient. So it, it's. An, it's a, a feeling of, of, of it, it's a feeling of voyeurism uh, to work on correspondences in the first place. I think because you're you're reading someone's uh, private writings uh, that you're really not supposed to be reading. Uh, so there's th- that kind of extraordinary feeling, and there is. Um, I was quite surprised that she was so politically engaged uh, when I started researching Elizabeth, I thought um, because of of all the kind of mythology around her that she would only write about uh, plays and ballets and romances, as her granddaughter so uh, famously put it. Uh, But she only wrote about uh, military treatises um, and and movements of armies. And uh, so there was very little uh, culture um, which I had expected. She she has extraordinary relationships with uh, a lot of people. But one letter that struck me in particular is when she puts the Archbishop, Archbishop William Lord, in his place. She advocates for war and William Lord writes to her that she should not wish for war because uh, she is a woman and it would be unchristian of her to do so. And then she replies saying, I, I'm, I might be a woman, but I know more about wars uh, than you do. And having read it, the chronicles of my ancestors, uh, the best piece is fought by is made by war and, and, and not uh, by, by treaty. Um, so she has such a strong voice, which is quite unique in this period. Uh, she doesn't hide between uh, behind epistolary rhetoric, you can sort of really feel what a strong woman this was. You have really opened my eyes today into who she was because I hadn't really thought about it all that much. I tend to focus more on the tutors, but the reign of her father and mother has always interested me as well. So I love that you've been able to open my eyes and hopefully the listeners' eyes as well as to who Elizabeth Stewart really was. Now, before we wrap up, I do have a couple more questions that I want to throw in here. And I'd love to understand, Nadine, what did Elizabeth's final years of her life look like? Yes, again, it's a different period. From the moment she becomes a widow in 1632, to 1642, she is a kind of political regent, and um, her son it, it, uh, are still minors, um, and and um, her eldest son by that time is also still in prison. So she's very much the regent. Once he reaches his majority, uh, she takes a step back, still comments upon uh, the political events, but then also struggles quite a lot because her son doesn't necessarily want the same things as she has fought for all these years. So, for instance, she always managed to not to accept a compromise. Uh, They offer her part of the platinate. The platinate consists of two parts, the upper and and lower platinate. And she was offered part of it as early as 1636. She managed to say, no, I want all or nothing. And then her son in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia is quite happy to get half, which, of course, she could have accepted years before. So she falls out with her son and her son, Charles Louis, also denies uh, his mother her income, her jointure, that, so uh, her income that she should have right to as a widow. So she she falls out with Charles Louis, and they're quite uh, there's an exchange of quite strong letters between them. And she has accumulated a lot of debt in in the Hague, 
refuses to leave the Dutch Republic before all her her debts have been uh, paid, or at least there is that promise at the restoration that her nephew will take care of all the debts. And only then she returns to England in, in in her final year of her life. Wait, she did return to England? Yeah, she did. She did. Um, so after the, the restoration, uh, she hopes that she will get another invite. Because as you mentioned, a lot of people have died by that time. So there's not much left for her. Um, all all her, her friends in, in The Hague have died. But, uh, but her nephew, with whom she had a quite a close relationship, Charles II, has been restored to the throne. Uh, so the royalist cause has also been fought. She had a kind of alternative to a court on the continent, which attracted loads of political uh, and religious refugees during those civil wars. All of that is behind her. And she wants to return to England. And she returns, but that infight to the actual Stuart court, uh, she will then never receive. Because Charles II is also a bit afraid that his aunt might be more popular than he is or ever will be. Um, So she lives in a house uh, rented by one of her friends, the Lord Craven, and she dies uh, soon after. I'm really curious to hear this answer from you, because I want to know after our conversation today, I think my eyes have been opened quite a bit to some of the stuff that's on the Internet isn't true. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. (laughs) A lot of it isn't true. (laughs) Right. So I want to know, let's just wrap this up in a tight little bow. What are the most common misconceptions about Elizabeth Stewart? One is that she loved her, her, her dogs and monkeys more than her children, uh, which is a quote taken out of context. Um, it's actually uh, from a satire written by one of her daughters. Uh, but people don't often remember that it is a satire and they take that completely out of context. Um, yes, she had a lot of uh, dogs and monkeys. Uh, most of them were for the, her children to play with. And uh, she loved her children dearly. Uh, in fact, she fought her entire life to to get that inheritance back for her children. Uh, so she was a very caring and loving mother. Um, that's one of the other things. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography actually states um, that she was an uncaring mother. Uh, again, that's just misogyny. Uh, that there, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Another kind of myth is is that she was only interested in in plays and and the reading of romances. Um, She actually used, just very much like Anne of Denmark, used masks, for instance, for political purposes. And uh, yes, she she enjoyed reading, but she was very much politically engaged. Um, And there's so much evidence for it. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Can you tell everybody the name of your book and where they can find it? It's Elizabeth Stewart, Queen of Hearts. It's published by Oxford University Press, and you could basically find it anywhere. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.